Thanks for the introduction and thanks for coming. Um, it's great to see that the machine learning community is growing in Canada and in Toronto. And this is kind of a personal story for me, uh, starting with a sequence prediction and then meeting reinforcement learning. Mm. So I'm interested in developing machine learning algorithms that are simple, elegant, and applicable to many real world applications. And we are in a special time in the history of machine learning, uh, not only because we've developed uh, incredible machine translation and speech recognition systems, but also because um, we've done so using a unified framework. So at Google, for example, we have a code base that can be applied to machine translation, speech recognition, or program synthesis, or any other sort of sequence prediction task. And uh, this presents a unique opportunity for machine learning experts because they can have an impact across multiple domains. Now, it's also a special time because uh, we've seen great progress in reinforcement learning and planning, for example, uh, in the game of poker, Go, and playing Atari from Pixels, we've seen tremendous progress. And these are instances of sequential decision-making problems. Um, but in fact, there is a lot of similarity between sequence prediction and reinforcement learning. And in my research, uh, I try to see connections between these two uh, categories of problems. and. Uh, uh, advocate a dialogue between researchers across different groups. And f uh, more specifically for this talk, we will be, we'll be focusing on sequence prediction, but we'll be borrowing ideas from reinforcement learning. And I promise we wouldn't just apply naive, uh, I mean, just apply directly reinforcement learning algorithms to sequence prediction, but we'll be using uh, the characteristics of sequence prediction, for example, the fact that we are dealing with discrete variables, structured loss function, the environment is kind of known, and uh, we have lots of data. And so we want to use the insights from reinforcement learning and, but develop uh, uh, simple and elegant algorithms. All right, how many people here speak French? Uh, okay, uh, I don't know if this is a good translation of the box on the right. But it would be great if we could all uh, read French through our machine translation assistant. The translation says, as diets change, people get bigger, but plain seeding has not radically changed. Um, I cannot read the French part. Uh, but I may move, because these slides aren't that important. Um, it would be also cool if we could interact with our uh, computers through voice, and speech recognition is an uh, important component of uh, this interaction. And throughout the talk, I'll be using this phrase, uh, which is from the Wallace Journal dataset that we've been experimenting with, which is, as he talks, his wife holds his hands. Um, throughout the talk, I'll be using uh, x to denote an input and y to denote an output. But these variables are vectors. So it's not really a scalar valued uh, random variable, but it's a vector of random variables. All right. Um, you may be thinking already that this guy is kind of wasting our time. And we know that uh, learning a mapping from x to y is kind of trivial. And we've kind of solved it already. OK, I can uh, phrase that in the form of the following argument, which is feed forward neural networks are universal function approximators. And therefore, we can apply a feed forward neural network with an independent classifier for each output variable uh, uh, will work very well for any of these mapping problems. OK, uh, do you, do you kind of agree? So let's maybe look at a simple case where we have uh, sequences of four characters as outputs of our speech recognition system, and each character comes from one of the four characters, A, E, I, L, S. Okay? So if I train an independent classifier for each one of these variables, is it going to give me 
meaningful uh, outputs? You got to answer. Yeah. Why? Right, there is a structure within the sequence, um, but what's wrong with my line of argument, which is neural nets are universal function approximators, and let's suppose we have lots and lots of data. Okay, that, that's, that's a good response. So I would, uh, let's, let's maybe try training a speech recognition system together. And let's suppose the first input is SAIL, S-A-I-L. And we do stochastic gradient descent to update the parameters. And it learns. And here is the second input. And that is SAIL, S-A-L-E. Okay, we tune the parameters and we keep going. Apparently, there are only two examples in this data set. And uh, once we train, the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters would be basically probability of 1 on S, probability of 1 on A, probability of half on I and L, and probability of half on E and L. So not only the model would produce SAIL and SALE, but it would also equally produce SAL and SAI, uh, because uh, basically each variable is independent, right? And the problem is the output of space is combinatorially large, and the mapping may be one too many and ambiguous. So in order to uh, do a good job in solving this mapping problem, we, we need to also learn a representation of the output variable to help resolve ambiguities, which means that uh, basically we want to find possible uh, options in the output space. For example, SAL, S-A-L-L, -L, was not an option. So we would want to remove that option from all of the options in the, in the output uh, prediction. So we want to learn basically P of Y2, the dependency between uh, pairs of variables of Y uh, given X. And there has been extensive work on graphical models, loopy belief propagation, uh, message passing, uh, uh, approximate inference, approximate learning. But turns out uh, we can use a deep neural network to solve this problem relatively well via the following procedure, which is let's not learn an independent classifier for each output variable, but let's learn an, an independent classifier for each variable given the prefix, OK? So given an empty prefix, I'll be learning A. So the, the, the correct output here is as he walks, his wife holds his hands. So we would be predicting A. Then given A, we would be predicting S, so on and so forth. And so given each prefix, we would be predicting the next token, all right? And there is a cute idea to enable variable length outputs, which is let's have another special token end, which would determine the length of the sequence. Now, um, basically, there had been extensive work on this simple idea of mapping input and a prefix to the next token. And I call this uh, a, an autoregressive model. So for the purpose of the talk, I don't really delve into the neural structure of this model. But the real trick is to how to come up with an efficient model so that we can train on lots and lots of prefixes. We don't want to reprocess each prefix and, uh, and basically just have one uh, uh, supervisory signal for each prefix. But we want to share computation across prefixes and hence recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks. And so the tricks in sequence-to-sequence -sequence models uh, with soft attention, transformer, wavenet, etc., is how to learn about the architectures that would train fast and that would generalize well on the tasks that we care about. But the underlying mathematics of the objective function 
And the model is very simple. We represent the probability of output given the input using chain rule and an ordering of the output variables as a, uh, as a product of the probabilities or, or the log of the probability as a sum of logs. And then once we learn this model, at inference time we would be uh, finding an approximate uh, uh, map or basically the y that has the largest probability under this probabilistic model. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So, so far we've been just uh, going through the basics. Now, in 2016, uh, we wrote this paper called uh, Google's Neural Machine Translation paper in System. And basically, uh, we've scaled up this sequence-to-sequence -sequence model and applied it to large uh, production data sets at Google and also public data sets that were out there. And we observed that uh, the neural machine translation actually bridges the, ba the gap between phrase-based uh, and human translation. And actually, when you look at the translations, in the phrase-based case, um, it's more concatenative and it combines phrases in uh, ways that may not be holistically uh, appropriate, whereas the neural machine translation does this in a much more natural way. And maybe this was the first instance of applying neural machine translation at a larger scale, but uh, after that, we've seen other companies like Microsoft and DeepL uh, and other companies uh, applying these neural machine translation systems as, as scale and, and translation qualities have improved. But actually, there is still room for progress, and language has this long tail, Turns out some of these neural machine translation systems, when are given uh, inputs that don't make sense to them, produce outputs that don't make sense. Um, and so this is one example. Uh, and so one of the goals of my research is to try to identify the problems uh, with this scheme that I described, with the autoregressive scheme trained with conditional log likelihood, and how to improve them. All right, so this is the setup that I've described. We call this teacher forcing algorithm. And uh, you can think of it as learning a trajectory in a combinatorial output space. So given a prefix of the trajectory, we would be learning the next token. We could also think of this as the next action. Now we train uh, using conditional log likelihood, but we evaluate using blue score, and people identify the discrepancy between training and test uh, metrics, but also somehow it seems like we are only training on correct prefixes. And that can be problematic because at test time, we are doing this beam search over all possible prefixes, some of which may not come from uh, correct uh, sentences. And um, when you think about generalization, Given a prefix that doesn't come from my training data distribution, there's no guarantee that the model would produce reasonable probabilities. And so this is something that people have tried to explain as exposure bias, but basically it's about the mismatch between the training and test distribution. Uh, so there is this uh, idea of what if we directly apply reinforce to translation, which is we would be optimizing expected blue score. And Ranzado et al. present this at ICML 2016. Well, this is better because we would be drawing samples from the model, so we wouldn't be training on correct prefixes only, but it's problematic because we are just not using correct trajectories that much. So the correct trajectories are only being used as part of the blue score. And we all know that uh, reinforce has a large variance and uh, has a noisy gradient, so we often have to pre-train using log likelihood and switch to reinforce and, we and, and be very careful with the learning rate and all that. So in, in that Google Neural Machine Translation paper, we presented this hybrid, which is what if we optimize a little bit of log likelihood and uh, a little bit of expected blue score together. And this helps 
But uh, still, we don't have credit assignment to the whole sequence. Uh, and uh, there are ways to improve it. It's kind of ad hoc, too, because we're just putting two different objectives uh, together. But turned out, we were able to improve blue score by about one point on a relatively good baseline. And that was considered significant. But then the problem was, um, somehow, users weren't happier with the model. So blue score went up by one point, but, but users didn't, didn't like it necessarily more. And that points out a problem with our metric functions. That, that's out of the scope of this talk. But one interesting res research avenue is how to possibly learn better metrics uh, and design better metrics. All right. With that, I'm going to talk about uh, optimal completion distillation, which is uh, our way of trying to tackle this problem of sequence prediction using ideas inspired by Q-learning. And we are going to apply this to speech recognition this time because uh, word error rate or edit distance is a better behaved metric. So we are hoping that improving word error rate would correlate more with users' happiness than blue score. OK, and this is joint work with uh, Sara Sabur and William Chan, both at Google Brain Toronto. OK, so uh, unfortunately, I think because we switched laptops, uh, the access to these went away. Uh, that's unfortunate. But basically, um, what this first video is supposed to show you is a a uh, driving lesson where the teacher drives the car and the student sits uh, next to the teacher, but then at test time the student is on, it, on his own and uh, they should be driving by themselves. And we know this is not a good way of learning driving. Um, and the ideal approach is that the student sits behind the wheel and uh, maybe crashes a little bit during training. But then uh, the good news is that at test time, they wouldn't be surprised. OK. Uh, I wish we could play the video. Um, but so now coming back to sequence prediction, um, we know how to train on correct prefixes, right? We, on correct prefixes, we would use a target that is the next token. I think the key question is, how do we train on incorrect prefixes? Given an incorrect prefix, what target should I be using for my model? Um, and if I had the answer to this question, then I could train on incorrect prefixes too. It's more convenient to train on correct prefixes because we know they're correct targets. Um, does that make sense? All right. So the general idea that uh, is applicable here is this notion of optimal completion. What if, given a prefix, I search over all suffixes and find the suffix that's optimal in terms of my reward metric? OK? And I claim that if I had access to the optimal suffix, then I could use the first token of the optimal suffix to teach the model. Uh, now, this is related to ideas used in reinforcement learning, and especially the notion of optimal Q values, which represents the optimal value of a state and action pair based on the optimal way of finishing that state or, or keep evolving that state. All right. But in reinforcement learning, we do not have access to optimal values, unfortunately. And there is this powerful idea of bootstrapping, which is I start with some random initialization, and I do some form of max backup to improve uh, my values. I mean, if you're not familiar with that anal analogy, I think it's fine. The, the thing is, in our case, 
we do not have to resort to bootstrapping type algorithms anymore because turns out we can actually compute the optimal completion exactly. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, iterative bootstrapping at all. Okay? All right. Um, let's look at our string again. And let's consider uh, this prefix as E. And uh, actually, there are three optimal completions for this prefix. And those are shown at the bottom here. OK? And uh, there are three equally valuable suffixes because we can do different, different types of alignment between the prefix and the target sentence. For example, we can delete H and we can delete H in the target, and then the whole thing would match. We can substitute E, the red E, with H, and then continue with the rest. Or we can just delete E and continue with, with the rest of the target sequence. So these are three possible ways that would all result in an edit distance of 1. Uh, and we can't do better than edit distance of 1, because our, we've already made an error. All right? Here is another example. In this case, there are two optimal completions. And here is another one where there's only one optimal completion. OK? So the key question is uh, um, how to learn these uh, optimal completions. But before answering that question, if we had access to optimal suffixes, what we would be doing is that given a prefix that's not necessarily correct, I would be finding all the possible uh, completions, all the optimal completions, and, and maybe just use the first token of all of those as targets. One, one strategy would be to have an equal probability on all of these targets. So we would be having a probability of one third over H, E, and space for this prefix, and we would be having a probability of one half for H and I. In this case, it would be just a one hot uh, target. Okay? So this is. This is the algorithm that we call optimal completion distillation, because it's trying to distill the knowledge of optimal completions into our sequence model. And the main benefit is that we would be training on the mistakes of the model, and we would be accommodating. So you can think of it as there's a stubborn teacher that doesn't care what the student says and keeps saying, oh, the quick target is this. And there's a more lenient teacher who looks at the uh, the essays of the student and tries to give hints that improve them uh, slightly. And it turns out this matters quite a bit. All right, so uh, the algorithm would look like this. So we sample from the model until it emits end of sentence. We, own, we, we are not sampling from the correct targets anymore. We're just sampling from the model. Then we find a set of optimal completions. And for each prefix in that sampled sequence, we optimize the KL divergence between the set of uh, optimal targets and the current uh, distribution of the model. And uh, so the key technical contribution of our work is coming up with a way to compute these optimal completions for the case of edit distance. But please, yeah, that's, 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 that's the key question, right? And the lemma that we are going to prove hopefully together is that optimal completions for edit distance are always suffixes of the target sequence. It's kind of an intuitive thing, but uh, we've got to prove it, right? And to prove it, let's look at the algorithm that we use for computing edit distance, right? You remember that dynamic programming algorithm that basically stores a table uh, of edit distances between prefixes of string s and uh, and a string t, right? So here we have Saturday and Sunday as two strings. And each cell here shows the edit distance between a prefix in Saturday and a prefix in Sunday. And what we can do is that we can update uh, the values by looking at three values that are above, above to the left, and to the left. Uh, and so for this example, Turns out the edit distance is 3. And we've updated this 3 diagonally for a couple steps, because these uh, characters match. 
And then uh, we've done here a deletion, another deletion, uh, and then a substitution. Okay, but what matters is that given the, the value of edit distance, this path that I highlighted here is uh, non-decreasing. So going from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, you can't decrease because the dynamic programming algorithm is correct. And so what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to give you a constructive proof that shows that uh, the edit distance, uh, the optimal edit distance has to be uh, against one of the suffixes of the uh, correct target. So, so I'm going to actually not only prove that, but also construct all of the possible completions. And so for that, let's suppose the prefix is SAT. And so we have a whole bunch of question marks here. Even the length is unknown. And let's suppose the, the maximum, sorry, the, the minimum edit distance is M, right? A, a, the minimum over all possible suffixes, all right? The key is that M has to be larger than equal to because of the other thing that I described, that paths going from top left to, to M are all non-decreasing, right? So M is larger than two, and for all of the twos in this row, we can actually construct a suffix. So for this one, Saturday, for this one, Saturday, and for this one, it's my favorite, sat day. So we just, you just sat and you just sit in that day. All right, so basically what turns, turns out happening is that we can just compute the edit distance between the predicted sequence and the original target sequence. And for each prefix, we can just look at the characters in the next column and use them as the targets. Because basically all of these values correspond to a completion that was uh, concatenating the corresponding suffix with the prefix. The corresponding suffix of the target with the prefix of the predicted sequence. Okay, so was that proof? Uh, okay, I guess it, it was a proof sketch. You can try to uh, uh, clear that up maybe after the talk. But basically, the take home message is that there exists an order n times m algorithm that finds all of the optimal targets and also all of the optimal q values in terms of what's the minimum attainable edit distance going forward from a prefix. And uh, um, basically, there are some connections with Q-learning and policy distillation that led, led us to develop this algorithm. The fact that we can think of a prefix as a state and a token as an action, and basically the reward or the return is the negative edit distance uh, when compared against ground truth. And, uh, and the optimal Q values for each state action pair or for each prefix token pair is the maximum attainable return or minimum attainable edit distance. And basically, we define this soft optimal policy, which is uh, normalized exponential of these optimal Q values. That's why we had this soft target, and then distill that uh, into the model. And here is an example of a target, kind of target sequence that we get in the Wall Street Journal with the integrations of communications and consulting units, there may be a greater degree of crossfire fertilization, Mr. Miller said in a statement. And uh, the baseline uh, gets fertilization incorrectly and produces for the more, for the more, for, uh, maybe they're uh, acoustically similar, and also it adds an S at the end. But excuse get the language for the OCD case. Our model combines cross and fire into one word and then produces fertilization instead of fertilization. And also uh, produces Miller instead of Miller. And uh, so in this case, actually, our errors are larger. But uh, the kind of errors that the model makes actually make more sense. Um, I probably skip over this example. Uh, 
this plot is interesting because what it shows is that um, if we train a model using teacher forcing, it actually does a good job at getting uh, a perfect alignment between the predicted outputs and the original target. So what this shows is if I train a model using teacher forcing, the blue curve, and then I do beam search on the training data, how many of the characters match the exact character at the same position? Right? So there's no alignment happening. Index i of the target should match with index i of the prediction. And if not, that's an error. In our case, this is actually not as good as teacher forcing. So teacher forcing is doing a very good job in getting that accuracy to be very high. But actually, when we look at character rate, which is something that we do care about, turns out even at the beginning of training, where we are at a accuracy of 0.5, we are better than teacher forcing. So this shows that this idea of rigid alignment between the prediction and the target doesn't correlate very well with the edit distance. And that's a, dis that, that's a discrepancy in training of these teacher forcing models. Uh, now here we report character error rate and word error rate for the Wallace Journal data set for a whole bunch of methods. Turns out our baseline already improves upon several of those uh, methods. Obviously, if you tune your neural network, you can uh, just get away with a simple algorithm that's not uh, super novel. Uh, now, if we do schedule sampling, which is another way to kind of get rid of this issue of training only on correct prefixes by occasionally sampling from the model, but then the targets are going to be the same. So the, so the difference between a schedule sampling and our algorithm is twofold. One, in a schedule sampling, the targets are the same as the original targets. But two, schedule sampling combines the model predictions with correct targets. Because if you just do sampling, it doesn't work. So, so you have a knob that is for each character with what probability you would sample from the model and with what probability you would sample from the, uh, you would just select the target uh, token. But th that's okay. If, if, if my explanation wasn't clear enough, I think that's fine. The, the main uh, outcome is that we can improve uh, the, the seek to seek baseline by a relatively big margin, reducing the word error rate by about 1.3% and uh, the character rate by about 0.5 absolute percent. But relative, it's, uh, it's much more. Okay, and, and now we are the state of the art in this data set uh, using this uh, algorithm that we call OCD, Optimal Completion Distillation. So, um, you, we want to try this on other data sets. We think it's a very uh, interesting algorithm that has a cool name too. And um, we want to try this on machine translation as well. Um, um, we haven't gotten uh, far yet. And, uh, and there are some aspects of the algorithm that could be improved. This algorithm is completely off policy in that uh, the target doesn't depend on how the, the prefix has been selected, whether it's been selected from uh, a model by sampling or by beam search, or whether it's adversi adversarially generated and all that. So, so I think uh, there's the algorithm, the, the specific algorithm that we presented, but there's also the underlying technique that uh, allows us to compute these uh, optimal values very efficiently, and that can be applied to other schemes as well. All right, so that concludes the first part of my talk. Let's see how we're doing in terms of time. I guess uh, let's try to go for another 10 minutes. Is that fine? Yeah. All right. Okay. Depends on how many questions you guys ask. So in the second part of the talk, I'll be talking about sequence prediction again, but in the context of program synthesis. And in this case, we do not have a strong supervision at the level of program. So the programs are latent. And I think that's much more interesting. 
so it would be really cool if we can convert natural language to programs because we could ask uh, the model to write a program to find the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And, um, and if it works, that would be awesome, right? Um, now, there are two ways to go about this. One is to have a strong supervision, which means that we would need to know the program that finds the answer to life and everything, um, which was basically the goal. So not only strong supervision is hard to collect and boring, but also in cases that we want to generalize to interesting new problems that we don't know the answer to, it's uh, kind of uh, useless. So the setup that we are interested in is a setup where given a natural language question or instruction, we run a model to produce a program or database query, then we run the query, possibly compile it or run it on a database and get the final answer and compare the final answer with the correct answer. So we know the correct answer, but we, know we, do, what we do not know the program. And uh, th for that reason, we call this weak supervision. We still have supervision at the final answer level, but we do not have supervision at the program level. And it's this, this form of supervision is much cheaper to collect, and it doesn't depend on the programming language of interest. And, uh, and uh, it's also technically more interesting. OK? So we can uh, think of this whole procedure of running a program and getting a final answer as a reward function that just tells us whether that program worked or not, whether it compiled or not, and maybe there is a real valued reward or maybe there is a binary reward. Okay? But the fact is um, most of these reward functions are going to be non-differentiable. They are often terminal, only they appear at the end of the program. Um, but, but also there are these other characteristics such as uh, the fact that these tokens that we generated are discrete and the whole dynamics of the system in terms of how programs are generated is, is deterministic uh, and also the, the rewards are very sparse. So we want to make use of all these characteristics to develop new, uh, new sequence prediction algorithms. Okay, so let me show you one example of the task that we are going to be solving. Uh, for example, uh, the question may be how many more passengers flew to Los Angeles than Saskatoon? And uh, we have access to this table in the form of its uh, column names and entities and stuff like that. And we want the model to produce this structured query, which is let's uh, filter row that contains Saskatoon as its city and filter the row that has Los Angeles as its city and let's compute the difference between the passengers of those rows. Okay? So this is one example of a program that actually our model has produced. And the final answer is uh, 12,467. So there are two problems that we are trying to tackle here. One is a search problem, an exploration problem over the space of programs, trying to find programs that would actually work. And this is very expensive. We would not get a, a long way by just uh, uh, naive exploration of the space. But, but also, there are spurious programs that do not generalize well. Because in this setup, we have a whole bunch of examples during training but unlike a lot of RL benchmarks, we actually do care about generalization, which is at this time we would be seeing new tables and new questions, and we want to be generalizing to those. The problem is, for example, if, if the question is uh, which nation won the most silver medal, if that nation turns out to won the most gold and bronze medals too, uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, bronze or gold or total medals, we're talking about silver medal. And, and so that's the distinction between correct programs and spurious programs. I don't know which competition this is that Nigeria was the most uh, successful one. Okay. 
again, we can apply the reinforced algorithm. And if you believe that it's going to work, then maybe you should try it. <laughs> one, uh, one problem is, uh, let's say the reinforced algorithm somehow finds a very, very good solution, right? And we do one stochastic gradient step on that solution. But what if that solution is not generated again from the model? Basically, that solution is lost. And because of the high variance of gradients, there are occasional successes in terms of finding good action sequences, but the model can easily forget them. And this makes the whole procedure very inefficient because we have to keep repeating and repeating the same action sequences in order to be able to upweight their probabilities. And so there, there has been this idea in the air that is, what if we kind of combine log likelihood with uh, reinforce again, so that the, the element on the right is the expected reward objective that we had. But what if we also store a buffer of top k performing programs for each one of the sequences and try to increase the probability of those programs through this log likelihood objective. Again, teacher forcing. So we would be doing teacher forcing on the best programs found so far using supervised learning. And then we would be doing reinforcement learning on the side to find uh, 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 even better uh, action sequences. OK? Does that make sense? Uh, and uh, this is actually quite successful and, and solve some of the problems with, uh, with the original reinforced algorithm. Uh, but it's not technically satisfying because of the ad hoc nature of the objective. We have top k in there too, which is a very awkward mathematical object. And so one uh, technical question is, can we actually uh, make the the objective more sound, and at the same time, can we improve the, the technique? And actually, the idea is surprisingly simple. Here, here is basically the idea. So we call this memory augmented policy optimization, MAPO. And, uh, and for that, we assume we have this buffer beta of action sequences yi and corresponding returns ri. OK, so y is a sequence here. What we could be doing is that we could be computing the expected reward objective in terms of the sum of two terms and enumeration over the buffer. And a Monte Carlo estimation outside of the buffer. Is, is that clear? So basically. Because the environment is deterministic in that if I run the same action sequence again, if I run, run the same program again, it would produce the same reward. I don't have to run that program twice. Just once is enough. And I know the reward, right? So why not just do an expectation, just do an enumeration over the programs that I've collected so far, and then I just have to make sure that in the other step, I don't do double counting, in that I should not be sampling trajectories in the buffer in the second term. Otherwise, this is going to be flawed and, and biased. And this uh, simple idea can be expressed in another form, which is, what if we represent the original expectation into a linear combination of two expectations, one expectation inside the buffer. So here we are normalizing the probabilities inside the buffer and sampling an action, action sequence. And in the other case, we are normalizing the probability outside of the buffer. But then we would be multiplying these two terms with the marginal probability of the buffer. So this P of beta is the sum of probability of trajectories in the buffer. So this is how much weight we have on the buffer and how, how much of the space hasn't been explored according to our current uh, probabilistic model. So 
what we can be doing is that we can adopt the reinforced algorithm to estimate the gradient of this term because this involves trajectories that I'm not uh, uh, familiar with. Whereas in this case, I can just, just do enumeration. And so we don't care what the origin of sequences in the buffer is, whether it's coming from previous versions of the model or whether it's coming from random search, and, and, and we can handle all of that. Now, to answer the other question that kind of Marcus alluded to, we, so first of all, we initialize the buffer with random samples. So we do random exploration to find at least a few programs that kind of work. Uh, but we also lower bound the probability of the buffer. Because at the very beginning, when we are doing cold start learning, the buffer is going to have a probability of zero anyways. Even though it has very good trajectories, uh, because we've done some random uh, search, the, the model may not appreciate that those are good trajectories. And for that reason, we have a threshold that says, um, let's have uh, uh, a reasonable probability on the buffer. Um, and I mean, I probably shouldn't go into the details of the algorithm. You can uh, look at the paper once it's out, hopefully we'll be putting it on archive in the next uh, uh, week or so. So essentially what, what's happening here is that we also have, an, uh, we have a distributed implementation uh, and we short training data and we have different actors that collect new programs and try new, uh, new sequences of uh, characters. And then we have one learner that uh, learns uh, on the collected training data. And this is inspired by the Impala architecture from DeepMind. All right. So the wiki tables questions is the data set that I showed an example at the beginning of the uh, presentation of this section of the talk. And um, it, for example, has a question, which is Greece held its last summer Olympic in which year? And so we got to come up with the program that gives us the answer of 2004. And here are some programs. Uh, which other ship was launched in the same year as the Wave Victor? So it filters uh, all rows that have Wave Victor as their name. And then it searches for uh, uh, this launched column. Uh, and um, and then finds the string of that row that has the same launched year as Wave Victor. So this is a quick program. That's kind of a complicated one. And also, we don't ha we, I don't visualize the tables, unfortunately, but you've got to imagine how the table looks like. This is the most points were scored by which player. And uh, we, fi we first find the maximum number of points. Automatically, this is inserted as variable zero. The outcome of the first row is automatically inserted as the output of variable zero, as the, as the variable zero. And then we, we hop variable zero player string. So we find the row that has the largest number of points, and then we return the variable string. So in this data set, uh, people have published results uh, in the last year or so. And uh, it's a very difficult data set but we can uh, get reasonable results. And in this case, uh, with an ensemble of five models, we get about 2.5% uh, improvement in the test uh, uh, accuracy. So this is, uh, given the programs produced, in what fraction of questions the output is correct. So it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, scoring mechanism. But we also did an interesting experiment where we compared on a, another data set called WikiSQL, which has the correct programs. So we handicap our algorithm by not providing the algorithm with correct programs. And we can beat uh, the state of the art using an ensemble again without using any form of program supervision, which is a strong result. I should 
point out that the, in, the, in the meantime, there was a paper on archive that got about 78. <laughs> so we can't quite claim that without uh, strong supervision, we can beat everyone else, but it's uh, possibly competitive. And so maybe this is more interesting, where we compare the reinforced algorithm with a whole bunch of other strategies. So reinforced doesn't do well at all. Uh, you can collect programs using any uh, exploration strategy and keep optimizing the log likelihood uh, of the programs on the, on the buffer, right? So I will be teaching the model to produce all of those programs with the same uh, probability, right? So I'm going to put a uniform probability on all, of the pro on, on all of the programs in the buffer, and I would force the model to produce them all. But as in the EM case, the model has the flexibility to select a few or a, or a bunch of those and assigns high probability to them and low probabilities to others. So you can think of this as a multi-instance learning setup where, where I don't have all of the programs. It's approximate multi-instance learning where kind of there's a complicated exploration using my own model. Uh, but turns out, so this is a relatively fair comparison because we've done it with our own architecture. Turns out the power of MAPO actually comes from the expected reward objective. And, uh, we get much better generalization, both in the case of wiki table questions and wiki SQL data sets. Uh, and so it's also interesting to look at the difference between the EM variance and the log black -tailed. On the wiki tables, that matters. But on the wiki SQL, that doesn't seem to matter much. But we also provide uh, relatively similar gains on top of the EM uh, baselines. All right, so with that, uh, I'm going to conclude uh, by saying that we got to have more conversation between these two, uh, these two uh, research uh, communities. And uh, we've, we've got to develop algorithms that borrow ideas from each one and apply to the other. Thank you. <laughs>